welcome to another episode of I Know of the Torture Beatles podcast, where I take guests and torture them. And well, not really, but welcome to an episode of Solo Beatles podcast. I am your host, um, with the hostess with the mostest. Um, and I have a really fun guest for you today. Now, he comes from Oregon. He has wrote, written a few books, one of them being Mark Arnold Picks on the Beatles, which I love the cover art for. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, welcome to the show. Hello, how are you? I- I'm good. It's Vermont and it's cold. Hey. Well, all I've seen of Vermont since I've only been to Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, and New York uh, is on Newport, so I don't know. <laughs> Maple syrup. All right, very good. Yeah, I, my plan was when I went there, uh, this is back in like 2009 or something, I was going to go, and then there was a freak late snowstorm in April, and it canceled on my plan, so I did not go to Vermont or New Hampshire or Maine, so... And if you if you hear dogs in the background, those are my dogs, and they, they're quiet as church mice until I get on the podcast. So there we go. So you're gonna hear dogs. Mark, um, do you want to plug your podcast? Because you do have a really good podcast. For you. <laughs> I have a podcast called Fun Ideas Podcast. I started in 2018. Uh, people ask me all the time, "What's the main subject?" And I go, "Well." It's anything I'm interested in. So it could range all over the place, but typically it's about comic books, animation, movies, TV, and music. Those are kind of the five subject matters. And, but I can veer off. If somebody has a good talk about, say, matchbook covers, which actually was a show, we're going to talk about it. So You haven't talked about um, animals yet, I don't think. Animals, no, <laughs> I have not. <laughs> be my next podcast. Well, my dogs have been on the podcast, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Those are your co-hosts. Yes, and they interrupted one podcast completely, but I actually, it was a longer one, so I actually used it as a natural break, saying, part two next week because the dogs stopped my podcast. So, it, it turned out it was just because the male person came to the door and it was fortuitous timing because it had already been a couple hours and I said, well, this is a good natural cut off. And then we got the dogs quiet into the second half, but it made for a nice show. Wow. So there hasn't been a ton going on, but we should um, mention the passing of the really sudden passing of Bob Saget. I, I did not see that coming like at all. I mean, I don't know if since I've been at work there's any more details that came out of that, but it seems like uh, he died of, for lack of a better term, natural causes. I mean, that's at 65, that's pretty young to, to die of natural causes, but they can use that term as early as in their 20s or 30s if they have to. Um, but there was no suspicious things that he was hurt or anything one way or the other. Yeah. But like he posted, it's just so sad. Like, yeah. I was hoping like nobody's going to die in 2022. Like after what <laughs> awful New Year's Eve passing with Betty White, like, come on. Well, I hate to say, and, and some people get really disgruntled that people die every day. They die all the time. And, you know, I, I, I actually had discussions on this on Facebook. It's like, I you saw know, that you could, you could go, well, they come in threes. Well, uh, for me, since I know so many people, you know, yeah, come in like 300, you know, it's like, I know, I post people all the time. People think I'm very morbid, but it's like, I, I, I like and respect these people, you know, I'm, I'm in a pop culture historian. So, you know, Bob Saget, of course, is a big one, but I mean, I'll post somebody obscure like Tony Tallarico. If you're not into comic books and certainly not into, uh, you know, com- kind of cheesy bad comic books from the 60s and 70s you're not going to know who that guy is but it affected me because i read his crap back in the 60s and 70s so now get, getting to our 1972 topic now yes. it's still my <laughs> That's a smooth transition. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how 
how old were you in 1972? I was born at the tail end of 66. So for the majority of 1972, I was five years old. Ah, yeah. so I'm guessing you were like in kindergarten. Well, actually, I was a year ahead, so I was a year ahead. Yes. Yeah. Oh, smart, smart kid. And <laughs> so I graduated high school. So. Anyway. So you're in first grade. Um, do you, were you, how like, how prolific was your Beatle knowledge? Not much, at least consciously. And I'll tell you how that, I mean that. Okay. So. I always tell people I became a Beatles fan in 1977. And that was because that was the year that uh, I was already a Monty Python fan. I loved comedy and stuff like that. And Eric Idle hosted Saturday Night Live. Uh, and he did this crazy rendition of Here Comes the Sun, where he goes, Here comes the sun! Vroom. If you haven't seen it, it's on. YouTube. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. And I asked my parents, I said, what does the real song sound like? He goes, oh, we have the album in the, the bin over there. My parents actually had a few albums in their collection. And I go, well, which one is it? And he goes, it's the one with the four guys walking across the crosswalk. And I go, oh, okay. You know. And then I started playing it. I go, yeah. I, I, start, I played Here Comes the Sun. I go, oh, I know this song. And I said, well, what else is on this record? And I flip it over. I start with Come Together. I go, I know this song. And the next song, Something. I know this song. And then the next song, uh, I think is Oh Darling, is that right? Or Maxwell Silver Hammer. Yeah, I had never heard that before, but bang, bang. I thought it was a cute song. And then Octopus's Garden, I go, oh, I know that song too. And it's like, this is not right. You're not supposed to have all these hit songs on a regular album. That's only for greatest hits. I didn't know anything about it. But had I heard of the Beatles, of course I had. Um, did I know what they did? Um, in 1972, um, Here's my knowledge of what I knew they did. Uh, Yellow Submarine, uh, Octopus's Garden. Uh, actually, I didn't know they did. Well, yes and no. I'll say yes and no. <laughs> um, uh, I knew of Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey, and I knew of Imagine, but I didn't distinguish Beatles or Solo. I didn't know that concept. I kind of vaguely knew that the Beatles were a big thing in the 60s and weren't together anymore. But that's pretty much it, you know, because I mean, I'm five years old. I mean, I don't even know if your Beatles, I don't know when your Beatles knowledge started, but I mean, was yours that knowledgeable at age five? I wish, but. Um, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> um, so my, I'll allude into my story a little bit because why not? Um, Ninth birthday, of course, it has to be number nine. I got the Imagine album. Um, my grandfather got it with like a little Snoopy record player. And a year later, I got Pepper on the 50th anniversary. And oh, that was worn out. And I have not stopped since. So, I mean, age wise, you probably got into it about the same time I did. Timeline wise, of course, you know. So, 1972. My mom listened to uh, AM radio voraciously, and she bought seven-inch singles. She didn't necessarily buy Beatles or Beatles-related ones, but uh, songs I remember they used to play that I liked. Um, and I don't know if you've heard these. If you haven't, well, you know, you can look them up, of course. Um, Popcorn by Hot Butter. I like that synthesized sound. Um, Brandy by Looking Glass. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and oh, here's another thing my mom would do is I would, uh, some record would be a hit. And my mom, since she was a collector of records back in the 50s, she'd say, Oh, I have the original. And so, like, big hit in 1972 was Rock and Robin by Michael Jackson. Well, my mom goes, I have the original of that one. And, and it's like, it was weird to me because I always thought, Well, somebody else is supposed to sing it or somebody else is going to sing it. They have to say it exactly the same way. And Michael had a high voice and this, the original singer, which names escapes me off the top of my head, uh, had a low voice. And I go, well, that's, that's not right. You know, I had all these arbitrary rules about music, you know, that you can't have multiple hits on a non-greatest hits album. You know, you, you know, just all these things you supposedly can't do, which are weird why I'd have these supposed rules, but I did. So. 
your sophisticated five-year-old with those rules. <laughs> uh, um, but I mean, it's like, I did do regular kid things. I mean, um, like I liked school kid magazines, like the big ones at the time. And I think they still publish like Jack and Jill and highlights and things like that. Um, I love to read and I love comic books, of course. That's why I always talk about comic books and things like that. Um, now, as far as music goes, we'll keep it on the Beatles topic. Like I said, I knew about, oh, the other song I knew about was Come Together. I knew about that. I didn't know it was a Beatles song, but I knew it because they played it on the radio a lot. And, you know, the way that I always perceive 1972 for the Beatles, then and now, is it's kind of a lost year for them in some weird, bizarre sense. Like in 71, all of them had like a big major hit. You know, you know, Ringo had a dope for me, Lee had another day in it, uh, Uncle Albert had McCalsey, Paul John had up Imagine, and What Is Life was the carryover from you know, 1970, but still it was a hit in 71. And he had a, George had a minor hit with Bangladesh. So, you know, they're all on the charts. 72, George is MIA, kind of. I mean, I'll talk about that. Uh, Lennon is very out there, but then he does things that are not commercial, which we'll get into. Paul has just started Wings, but he starts Wings in a very, very bizarre fashion compared to what they came to be years later. <laughs> and uh, Ringo just put out Back Off Boogaloo. I am going to put out another single this year. I guess that's it. But it, it, strangely enough, it turned out to be the biggest record of the year for all of them. <laughs> You know, who would have thought that in 1972, Ringo would have the biggest chart success? <laughs> and, he, and he had to put, it out, put out another version in 1981 and in 2015. Yes, which is oh bizarre too. Right? Oh. <laughs> and the, the less said about those, the better. <laughs> yeah. You could have done a version of Mac the Knife if you know your history. <laughs> yeah. Not as bad as the 77 version of Wings. <laughs> Ringo, so, I love you, but don't ever let me listen to that version of that song again. So, um, then in 73, it's like, it's almost like they were ashamed of that year and everything came back. And so you got good albums by Paul, good albums by John. Good, well, Mind Games is, some people think it's kind of a weak album. But certainly, it's my favorite, Paul, John. It, it's, it's heads and shoulders above uh, sometime in New York City for most people. So it's like, um and uh you know george does another great album and of course ringo puts out what most people consider his finest album in 73 and there's the two the red and blue compilation so it's 73 was like let's brush that 1972 under the the, the carpet and we'll do something good again and not put out this uh bunch of crap for it. <laughs> now that's my assessment in in looking at it but you know when i look at it the way I did yesterday, I actually went through the whole calendar here, and I'll show you from some of my sources. These are some of my favorite Beatles books to go for solo years. Is the Beatles after the breakup? If you have that one, who, who oh, authored that? Keith Badman. Oh, and there's an updated version that I think goes to 2001 in paperback, and it covers George's death. So, oh wow, um, I used. Look, I use good old eight arms to hold you. Okay. And then this is a classic book that, this is like one of the first books I ever got, Beatles Forever by Nicholas Schaffner. Oh. He died I, way too young. You're talking about Saget dying young. I mean, this guy died like at age 38. So it's like, wow. I need to get that book. It's a very good book. It's not too expensive. This is another classic book, but it's very good. Beatles on record from Mark Walgren it came out about 1982. Um, some of it's a little bit dated. Well, I mean, all of these are dated because, you know, they only go so far, but I mean, it's like, they're, they're, they're handy. I mean, I like this book because it shows all the picture sleeves and the, oh, I love them. Yeah, and it, it gives the chart positions. Especially nice. um, this is another big Beatle book. It came out two or three times. This is the version I got first, which is a 78 version. Um, it originally came out in 75, 
And then there was a third version came out in 81 after John passed. And then the two authors who they've since passed vowed never to do another version again, which kind of bummed me out. But their reason was without John, there's no Beatles. It's like, okay, fine. <laughs> drives me crazy when people say it. And another good one, this is more recent one, and if you don't have it, you can still get this. The Beatles solo on Apple Records. By our good Spizer. friend, Spizer. Spizer. Yeah. Spizer's great. Yeah. So those are the ones I kind of looked into to do my research from 1972, because without doing it, I was just saying, what came out that year? Jim Lennon put out an album, and he did a couple concerts, and that's about it. And I didn't even think about how hard you know, it was. You know, but when looking at, you know, they were busy that year. It's just kind of an oddball year about putting out new materials. In many ways, like, you can look at the 70s as being kind of on and off, like, except for 70 and 71. Like, you obviously have, 72 was an off year. 73 was probably the best solo year for them combined. 74, you get, um, don't get an album. Well, you get Goodnight Vienna, which is a pretty decent Ringo album. You get um, Dark Horse, which I won't speak about that. <laughs> um, then we get um, Walls and Bridges, which is Lennon's second best album after Mind Games. Like, And then 75, you obviously got Venus and Mars. You got another crap album <laughs> from George. Um, what else was I going to say? But like, yeah, and then you get rock and roll. Like it just seems to alternate. Yeah. 74 kind of, I know we're supposed to be talking about 72. 74 always is like, let's repeat the success of 73, but nobody seems to do it quite as well. Although I think Walls and Bridges is Lennon's best album. But that's me, so. Thank you. <laughs> you know, for all those people who like the uh, Lennon Plastic Dakota band, it's good. It's good. I like it, you know, but he did a better one later sorry <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know it's like he doesn't have to shriek his lungs out to make a good album i'm sorry uh for me the uh, num number nine any album with number nine dream it's got to be a great album so that's it you know i mean it, it, it's all i'm gonna say about that for now since we're what, 72 so <laughs> now i think for beetle wise um obviously i think we kind of try out talked about george i did see that there was some recording done for material world um how do you feel about the material world album um first of all i will say this let me go back to this um i don't know if you've done this so i have to ask you about your beetle history because i don't know if you've done it. see if you've done the same path so i'll ask you a bunch of questions so i can answer it with this so when you became a beetle fan did you stick with group albums or did you jump? Well, you said you got Imagine right away, but did you jump all over the place? I mean, you got like 40, 50 years of material to go through. So, I mean, did you try to go chronological or did you not? Oh, gosh, no. I, okay. It's all over the place. Like, okay. I went from, I, after, um, I think I went from Memory to Chaos, okay. to the Ramp. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, you see, that baffles me, you know, it's like because. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it baffles people that are older than us, well, you know, combined, you know, it's like that, you know, my first Beatles album knowingly is Abbey Road. It's like, well, isn't everything a letdown after that? And I go, uh, no, but, you know, it's like, yeah, it is kind of odd to, to get the wrap up of their career at the beginning. But it might be a reason why I appreciate the solo album so much, because it, it, it you know, after Sgt. Pepper, and Magical Mystery Tour, I guess, kind of goes with that. You know, after that Summer of Love and everything like that, they still put out a couple more albums, but they weren't very unified even then. And, you know, any of them, White Album, uh, Abbey Road, or, you know, Let It Be, Get Back, whatever you want to call it. I mean, obviously, there's times where they sing together, like on Two of Us and stuff like that, but it almost seems like they're kind of going through the motions to a certain extent because they all kind of have the solo career kind of on the back burner like i could just do that you know i think even paul even though he probably wouldn't want to admit it have like man if i could get with another group of guys i could get 30 more tunes out you know because you know, they're holding me back you know 
he wouldn't have been it for the life of it. Like no, because he loved being in the band. It, you, it's evidence from this uh, the new Get Back footage that no one never saw until recently. But still, you know, you gotta wonder in the back of his mind. It's like it, it must have been once he got sensible about it, saying, "Wow, I can release any anything I want to," which annoys some Beatle fans. You know, it's like, wow, he puts out every little piece of noodling he's ever thought of, you know, nowadays, and he doesn't have a filter. You know, I get it, but, you know, <laughs> it's like... Did, did you see his Instagram built, like, his um, story on social media on New Year's Eve? Is that the one where he put it, the various spaces on himself? <laughs> yes, yes, <it's> sister. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> and somebody subtitled it, or maybe he did, you know, McCartney... And gets up to 21st century technology finally or something like that. It's kind of, kind of a harsh slam because actually, you know, in a certain respect, McCartney was actually in the forefront of a lot of technology that, that you know, sometimes Lennon gets credit for and things like that. I mean, uh, stuff and things like that. look at um, the uh, taking a journey urinal picture of driving rain. I mean, that was high technology for that time. Well, even you're wearing the McCartney two shirt. Yes. Know, as much as people badmouth things like, uh, they don't usually badmouth coming up, but they badmouth other stuff on that album, and they certainly badmouth "Wonderful Christmas Time," which was recorded at the same time. And it's like, this is innovative, dudes. You know, it's like unless you were like Devo or somebody that was like or Kraftwerk or this, you know, wanting to do that, you know, for a Beatle to do something that sounded remotely like this. I mean, it did get, you know, that album got Lennon, you know, you know, alert enough to actually want to come back into the studio. Who knows if he would have done it for another few years if he uh, didn't hear coming up and things like that. So, anyway. I think McCartney 2 is a very strong album. Yeah. One of his... So, songs. I asked you that question about <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me jumping around so when i got into being a beetle fan and i obviously didn't have endless supplies of cash even then i mean that's it, it, one wonders how you managed to get all the albums now but i guess you could stream everything and you don't have to buy that, that's what i've mostly done but like yeah. so i get it you know back in those days back in the 70s and my day you either had to buy the album hope for it to be on the radio or um, if the library happened to have, and that's my, that's where I got things, is I go to the library and get scratched up copies of different albums. Some were pretty good, but I remember, um, what was the album? Um, geez, I can't remember. It was one of the, one of the, I think it was Wings of the Speed of Sound or something. One of those albums. It's like, it was so stepped up beyond belief that I hated the album until... Oh, I know what it was. It's 33 and a third by George Harrison. It was like, it was so scuffed up beyond belief with skips and everything. I hated the album, but it's because I heard it so atrociously. And then now it's like my favorite George album. So. Same here. That's, so. I'm going to make a plastic do a show on that. So going back to this now. Okay, so if you've ever, if you've never read this, I recommend it. There are a few errors in it, but uh the cool thing about this book is they don't pull back their opinions about things. Uh, although, if you don't agree with those opinions, sometimes <laughs> you're like, her. but I will say this, when I, since I didn't know anything, you know, I figured their opinion was God, you know, this was it. And so um, they said things that I still quote to this day, which are kind of funny. Um, I think there's extra texture I'm using them as an example. Um, let me just double check to make sure I'm saying the right thing because it could be for Dark Horse. Um, oh, yeah, no, Dark Horse, they write this. You know, they have a standard description that says, it is a boring album. One wishes that it had not come from an ex-Beatle. And, <laughs> and they just don't like George at all, except for all things most that. They, they like that. And then, but this is the one I always liked on Extra Texture after the description. The last one says, it top 10, of course. It would. <laughs> I just like it would, you know, it's like that's not even grammatically correct, but it's still funny as hell. And so that's what, you know, they, they did on all these things like that. And so um, I was led to believe that basically group albums are great, solo albums are crap. And so I would start buying these things and I avoided things like Wildlife, can't get that album, 
Oh, I avoided that sometime in New York City. Can't get that one either. But the problem is, after a while, you get all the ones that are supposedly good, and it's like, all right, I got Band on the Run, I got the Leonard Plastic on a Band, I got Imagine, I got the Things Must Pass. There's like 30 other albums here. What, what you know, the, the, and some of them charted really well. And it's like, obviously, somebody liked them. And, um, you know, some songs that are universally maligned, like silly love songs, I actually like. So, that, that would be a top five McCartney tune for me. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so I go, I can't trust critics. I just have to go by my own opinion. And that's part of the reason I'm getting into plugging the book, why I did that, because, you know, the, my Mark Arnold picks from the Beatles, because I said, you know, I like this where somebody else doesn't. And it's like, you know, so I don't know. So, you know, I, I have this kind of weird vibe about 1972 based on what I read more than what I heard. And so I just said, wow, they were just really like lost in the wilderness that year. And, and I think, no, they weren't really lost. They were just trying new things. I think you know, the cool thing about uh, Beatles during the 70s um, and I will call them the Beatles because they're all still alive and they're all working for the same label at least for half the decade. Um, and they were all really trying to put out good stuff, even though sometimes it flopped. Um, there was, seemed to be like this still competitiveness that they had as a group, but just on solo records. So, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if the Beatles stayed together during the 70s. I mean, would they have always continued to put out number one records? I mean, I always I always say this. What, what would you say first? They would not have. It would have been like the Stones. 60s yeah. were great. Sure. Some stuff in the 70s. Eee. Yeah. <laughs> the Stones had number one records in the 70s, but I mean, they had number one they records that were kind of they were like phoning it in, you know. I mean, would, does Black and Blue really deserve to be a number one record? No. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> um, it's not as bad as Emotional Rescue. I actually like that. <laughs> but, okay, um, yeah, but I, I know you're. But, I yeah. think you, we need to have a debate on this on the Fun Ideas podcast. <laughs> emotional rescue the song or the album because the I'll, album. Agree with you on this. I'll agree with you on the song well the album okay it's kind of weird okay emotional rescue and tattoo you as much as they have hits i mean it's just some girls leftover so it's kind of hard to justify it on their own terms but if you say as a body of work of those three albums that came out there's a massive good amount of good material and i'll leave it at that you know we can go through it one by one in my show if you want to <laughs> uh, but, uh, um, and you know, well, my favorite uh, Rolling Stones song ever, and I always pick weird things, you know, I don't know if you do this too, it sounds like you do, um, is She's So Cold, which is on Emotional Rescue, and it wasn't a big, big hit, but I just love that song. Whenever it comes on, I crank it up, and I just like the bass line on Anyway. Now I have to ask you, what is your favorite album by each of the solo Beatles? Okay. Um, I will say, okay, I'm going to say my <laughs> whatever, because, <laughs> you know, arguably it could change. Because, like, when New came out by McCartney, I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The album. Um, my only complaint about it is, like, oh, I wish his voice was as strong as it was in the 70s. So it's like, you know, it's like I just, early days would not have worked in the 70s. Yeah. So, you know, um, and so, I mean, I'll give you my traditional favorite solo albums, and then I'll give you probably over time because obviously some displace this. Okay. So, uh, John, okay, Walls and Bridges. And this is after listening to every album. It's like the, it's not like oh, I came to Walls and Bridges. Back the first time I heard Walls and Bridges, it's good, you know, it's funky, you know. And then it was over time. This is and this is an assessment of listening to these songs over and over and over and over. So it's not like just a oh, this is it. And I can find weaknesses on every one of these albums that I are my favorites. 
Um, that, that's why Paul, you pick on the Beatles. Yeah. Paul's, <laughs> my favorite Paul album is Venus and Mars. Good choice. Uh, favorite George album, 33 and 3rd. And favorite Ringo album is Good Night Vienna. <laughs> Yeah. Really? Yeah. Strangely yeah. enough, those are all in this little seventies pocket of like seventy four to seventy six in there. So that's why I say, if you go long term, um, so for I'll go by each of them. So did Lennon put out another good album after Walls and Bridges? Mind Games. Well, that came out before. I mean, oh. after, after, after. I mean, uh, with with the Lennon material that. I think if you took the stuff that was on, um, I love rock and roll personally, but I know that's technically not a great album, but I love, I love Lennon doing all that old rock and roll stuff, but like, I like it mostly. It's not my favorite. <laughs> I wouldn't put it up. At, it's like a Randy titty rip it up. If you put that as just a track on say Wells and Bridges instead of Yaw Yaw, you know, a, a throwaway Yaw Yaw, I'd be like, yeah. You know? <laughs> But like, um, if you took the stuff from Double Fantasy and the stuff from Milk and Honey, I think, and he wasn't murdered, and like it was happy, yeah. like that would be a lot stronger on my repertoire. So you know, for me, I have difficulties. That's a whole show too. To talk about Double Fantasy. So you know, but I'll say that Double Fantasy. I listened to it recently. I can listen to it now, but for the longest time, I couldn't. Um, there's an emotion. Even, and I'm just going to talk about it strictly as is, it is. I'm not talking about Milk and Honey. I'm not talking about anything that came out remakes, remastered, uh, stripped down, whatever they've done. It's the real original album. Um, there's some good stuff on that album. And Yoko's stuff, some of it sucks, some of it's good. <laughs> I don't, there is one review that came out when that album came out right before he died. So it's a legit review. And I always like this phrase. I don't agree with it 100%, but it's like, you have to skip over Yoko's junk to get to Lennon's gold. <laughs> and I said, you know, when I got the album and heard it originally, I go, I can see their point because Yoko's voice, even when she's not shrieking, isn't everyone's taste. Yeah. Um, I've grown to love Yoko, but, uh, and I have all her albums, but I can still see why it's not everyone's taste. Although I did convert a couple people because I, I used to burn copies of, if Yoko did a Greatest Hits my way, uh, not the one she actually put out, the Walking on Thin Ice collection, because I think she put some shit on there too. Um, <laughs> that if, if she did the collection my way, I think there'd be a lot of people who would, where's this lady been all these years? You know, this is free. Yeah. Now they kind of did that later. I know we're going on a Yoko tangent now, but you know, with Yes, I'm a Witch and all those compilations like that. That, that kind of showed off, you know, kind of her strengths as a, as a songwriter and, and stuff like that, that not everyone sees right away because everybody sees the Lennon stuff because most of the time when she's on a Lennon record, she's shrieking her guts out. And it's like, you know, what, you can't convert anybody if that's all they hear. You know? yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, her favorite album, so, you know, even though you didn't ask, is... Uh, approximately infinite universe so there we go on that so um okay sure. so lennon double fantasy could have been a contender for almost his best album but you know it, it it's still twinged with the what if and you yeah. know there's kind of and, and you can't really do anything about that unfortunately um the best is on that lennon box set where they put the double fantasy and the milk and honey tracks together on this four. Is and, that the anthology? No, this is the one called Lennon. It's just, it has his face on the cover with the hat. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, this four, they put all the, the, the just the regular uh, uh, Double Fantasy, his tracks, and his Milk and Honey tracks, and then I think they had Every Man Has a Woman at the end, his, his version. Yeah. As a bonus track, as it were. So there's 14 tracks, yeah. And if you listen to that, you know, is that better than, uh, no, because the, the, I have problems with Milk and Honey. I mean, I like it that they released unreleased stuff, but it's like, it's an unfinished album and it's it like, is. 
the only uh, the only song that sounds good to me on that album really is uh, nobody told me or the rest of it could go which is <laughs> which is just a tearjerker knowing what happened after yeah. i still have a hard time listening to double fantasy all the way through i have yeah. to shuffle it yeah. i'll yeah. be honest well for me it's like you did, you were there at the time you know it's like i couldn't you know, I, I told this story pretty recently went on on the anniversary in December, and um, here, here's what happened. So, it, you know, I was already a Beatles fan. I had all of Lennon's albums by 1980, and uh, my mom knew it. And my, my and by 1980, I was like 12 to 13 years old, so I was already shopping for my own music. And so, my mom actually told me, she goes, "I know your birthday's coming up." I bought Double Fantasy. Don't buy it. And I, so I knew I was going to get it. But she did that so I wouldn't go and spend my own money getting it and, you know, spoiling. You know, so she spoiled the surprise. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fine. This was in November, you know. So it, it's like, I go, oh, I can't wait till Christmas. Ah, I can, you know, of course, granted, they're playing, at least they're playing just like Starting Over Woman and Watching the Wheels. I think they're playing on the radio pretty regularly, even before the murder. So I go, well, at least they're playing some of the songs, so I get to hear some of it. You know, then the eighth happens. And my mom actually did this, which I don't know is a good thing or bad thing. It's just kind of weird what she did. She goes, well, you know, I guess, you know, you'll want this now. She'll get, she gave it to me kind of like weird like that, you know, because she, I think she was, if she was more open, emotionally open at that time, she probably said, this is really fucking sucks let's listen to this album and, and commiserate about this but she didn't do it she just said here have it early you know and i go okay and i couldn't even listen to it i mean the day he died i actually the next day i actually stayed home from school and just listened to the radio all, all day long and it was like all beatles and then all day long and I'm, all day long <laughs> so, that's, that's, um, that's I could right. not listen to that album for years, at least 10 years. I could not listen to it. So I just had it on my shelf, you know, and I knew about it. You know, I did, you know, when Watching the Wheels came out as a single and Woman came out as a single, I bought them, but I didn't listen to them. I just had them. You know, it's like, <laughs> um, you know, oh, nice picture sleeve. You know, it's like, and it, it was always a bunch of what ifs and everything. Um, so, you know, again, we're supposed to be talking about 1972, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so, um, Paul, okay, Paul, for years, I said, what is their best, is best, is Venus and Mars. After that, over the years, I get repeatedly disappointed with albums that he put out, as much as I like them, and there's some albums that I love that I know you don't like very much, I know you said you don't like Pax and Peace very much, oh, I like that album, no. but there's crap on it. I like uh, Press to Play a lot. I like but that. There's, I like, there's I like crap that. on it. You know, I like the, the one I have trouble with a lot. Um, okay, well, going through McCartney's career, I think he should have put out Tug of War types of piece together and made a big, grandiose double fucking album and just kind of made this definitive <laughs> statement called War and Peace instead of this Namby Pamby thing because then everybody'd say, What a great album! He reprised Tug of War as Tug of Peace later on. Instead, now it sounds like a stupid retread. <laughs> you know? And it would have just been this big, you know, a big statement instead of just kind of like you get a home run with Tug of War and then like a bunch with Types of Peace. But Types of Peace is a great track. And I think uh, Say, Say, Say is a great track. It should be on the McCartney album. But when you put the albums together, then you go, hey, guess starring Stevie Wonder and... Michael Jackson. Oh, now it kind of fits together instead of just, you know. And hey, also Carl Perkins, you know, now it's a old star show. Okay. Anyway, that, that these are all my opinions. They are all in my book too. But anyway. Okay, the other missed opportunity. Um, a lot of people like the cars in the dirt. They don't like off the ground. I have trouble with both of them. What he should have done, McCartney at that time, is done a McCartney McManus album and ditched all of his other regulars, just had, you know, whoever plays with Elvis Costello and just done a McCartney McManus album. And in fact, it could have just been called McCartney McManus and have those tracks and maybe a few more. And that would have been better than Flowers in the Dirt or Off the Ground. So, so I'll give you my spiel on both of them. I think that 
my brave face um put it there um this one distractions we got married um figure of eight i actually prefer the live version from the um tripping the live um fantastic fantastic um album but um i think that if you actually merged them with some of the stuff from off the ground like i think that the stuff that um him and Elvis did that they didn't put on the album is actually better than like all that um I don't know you have you heard of the off the ground complete works box like that two CD pack? oh yeah 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 that's yeah. well that, I mean McCartney's notorious for for doing that he's always his, the worst judge of his own material his own best material and it, it's frustrating it's an exercise in frustration and delight. Because you can be frustrated because he puts out all this garbage on the album and then a good song will be on a B-side or unreleased, like Return to Pepperland. Like some of his best songs ever unreleased are like Return to Pepperland and The Cage and things like that. And even Water Spout's pretty good. And, you know, they're just all sitting there in the can, you know, waiting to be released some decade, maybe somewhere, you know. But it's like, you know, when you look at what actually was released on a lot of these albums, you know, he released that garbage and he didn't put out this track and it's like you see it all the time off the ground's a perfect example he had it, you know all these songs on the b side some of them are kind of lame like long leather coat and, you know <laughs> big boys bickering and everything but you know he has uh the the, the long version of cosmically conscious just yeah. thrown on some you know just for, there's a little snippet on the album or whatever maybe that's not even on the album but it's it like is. a at you the know. end, um, oh, okay, yeah, it is on the album because whatever I the last that. song is, yeah, <laughs> but the full version is kick, rock, kicks ass, and it's like, get off that stupid cat with the machine in its brain and put that song on there. You know, I hate that cat with the machine in its brain song. You know, I know he's trying to be politically whatever active and stuff like that, but it's like, Paul, your best writing Beatle type tune. Sorry, sorry, you're not good at uh political anthem. Sorry, you never were. You never are. <laughs> um, and to, to go back to 1972, give my, give my regards to Brasley. No, that's not what I meant. <laughs> give Ireland back to the Irish is what I meant to say. It just is not very good. <laughs> no. Know? No, it's not. Anyway. No. Um, let's see. So um, I think, okay. So then we went through the anthology. So Paul McCartney got reinvigorated. I think Flaming Pie is one of his best albums he ever did. Thank you. I think it is his best. It's yeah. tied with Memory Chaos and Back to the Egg for me. And then let's see, after that, I think he had a lot of what I call wilderness wanderings again. I don't think he, uh, Heather Mills did him a bit of good. I know you like Chaos and Creation in the Backyard. I think it's one that is on the par with, uh, um, what's the one that came out before that? Uh, right. Yeah, driving rain. I think it's like he's in a pot on that. And finally, memory almost full. Uh, finally, you know, makes amends to his career for me. Yeah, I love that album too. Yeah. Except for gratitude, that's god awful. Well, you gotta have the requisite bad Paul song, you know. <laughs> you could have done the Danny Elfman gratitude. That's cool. Yeah, like <laughs> for me, three good albums that he had consistently were Chaos, Memory, and this. Yeah, really good. That's actually a surprisingly good fireman. Yeah, and then, um, Shame uh, then I think, barring kisses on the bottom, which he should have recorded about twenty years sooner. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't have bad material on it. It's just sung badly. Um, the last few McCartney albums, I guess he wants to try to do well. I think you know. I don't know if you saw it. Do you remember? I don't know the name of the rapper, but it was some New Year's Eve party or something, and uh, or after Grammy party. That's what it was. It was after Grammy party, and he he was supposedly not allowed to come in to this one rapper's party, which I don't remember the rapper. And he was outside the door with Beck, and Paul said flippantly, but it's true. He says, "I guess we got to write a couple more number ones." You know, and it's like. It was a great line, but I think it actually hit him in, 
you know, some sort of spot because every album he's done since has gone to number one, essentially. I mean, it's like, so, you know, the ones that he did after that were new, uh, 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 Egypt Station and three, you know, and it's like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, and three imagines and you know, like that, but you know, it's like, three imagine doesn't exist in my blog. I actually like three imagine, but you know, it's, I, I, it's cute. <laughs> but I actually, I think, so going to those three that I just said, do is a kick ass album. Egypt Station's a kick ass album, except he left off. Uh, a couple tracks. In fact, I in a hurry for great. There's a song he should have put on there, and it, once again he fucked up his own. But that's the name of the song. Fifty Second Street, Frank Sinatra's Dream. <laughs> oh, what's the name of the album? Egypt Station. Okay, it's it's the Egypt Station song that's the first bonus track. You know that one? Home tonight. Yep. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Of- yeah. Home tonight in a hurry. I think no. it's it's the one he goes, uh he's talking about his brain and he can't he can't think today. Uh oh, hang on. I'll search this up on Apple Music. Uh I thought I had Egypt Station. <laughs> uh get started. What? Get started. Is it that? Nothing for free. Frank Sinatra. That's it. That's it. Nothing, Nothing for free. Yeah. That should have been on the real album proper. And I think that's like the, one of the best songs he's done in about 50 years. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's like that should have been a, a single record. I don't care if it was a hit. It was just like, I love that song. My wife loves it too. We'll jam on it all day. And it's like, that's the problem I have with Egypt Station. It's like, once again, I love the album, but he left off some stuff that he should have put on it. Um, unless you get the bonus tracks and stuff, which of course I do. But, you know, it's like I always think of these albums in two ways. Ever since Press to Play, I always have to think of a, what was intended as the album and then what's intended as the bonus tracks, which changes from year to year every time they remaster it and reissue it. But the original intention of the album, the original 10 to 14 tracks, not the bonus tracks. And then three is one of those ones typical of a McCartney album where initial listens, you know, and then it grows on you, I think. You know, some people say, it's the worst thing ever. I thought it was um, the best thing that he had done since memory. And, uh, you know, I think it's really good. Uh, And, you know, for people who who poo it, they go, eh, it's McCartney. It's like, okay. If you compare it to Frank Sinatra, Frank Sinatra did a duets album. He can barely sing on it in comparison. At least this guy's doing something creative and brand new. So I give kudos to Paul, you know, even if the songs are not completely up to snuff. But I'm used to this, you know, and you'll find this out. You probably already found out. Every McCartney album gets bashed when it comes out. <laughs> Later, they like it, you know. Uh, about the only one that didn't get bashed when it came out was probably Chaos in recent memory. They said, this is the greatest album that that, the producer kicked him in the ass. And I go, I don't know. I think all he did was make McCartney angry. It didn't make him write better tunes. It just made him all mad. (laughs) That's Um, the first question I asked Brian when I talked to him earlier today was, he um, he was like, "Ah, I would just stick to the room. Um, on Chaos, I will say, even the worst albums, in my opinion, um, have something redeeming about them. So I love um, Find Me. I think that's a great song. So I think that's it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> We're going to have to have a debate about this. Too. Yes. Okay. That's a good show to have a debate. Yes. About. Okay. Um, I, know it's an un- I know it's an unpopular opinion. You know, it's like, you don't I, have to tell me. You, know? have an idea. you have the popular opinion. Yeah, I have that's to, one of his best. Yes. So now going into the last thing we haven't touched on is the big bomb, which a lot of people will talk about in um, 72, sometime in New York City. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I wanted to finish George and Ringo. You can't go. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, so, oh, oh. Yeah, just post post 33 and third. I'll make it quick because I know we've been jabbering on the other thing. So post 33 and the third, the one that comes closest, I mean, you know, Cloud Nine's good, you know, 
it's a little schmaltzy in spots and i don't know got my mind set on you it's good you know but you know it's not written by george it's kind of it's almost like uh, all right you want a hit here's a hit you know it's like i'll just do somebody else's song so i think the best one that comes up to 33 and a third to my, for my money is actually brainwashed thank you you know it's like you know yeah it's posthumous but i mean it's like he left left blueprints out there my only complaint on that because i'll have a complaint about everything is they should have put horse to the water on it or reissue it now and put it on there what, you know, but, what they should have done is as much as i think brainwash they could have put um horse to the water to close it i think like as his last song brainwash is an act is a track that gets bashed a lot that i think is really great and i think it's better than that i hate to say there's a lot of meandering fluff i think in a certain respect you know barring the big hits that everybody knows on cloud nine some of the tracks are on gone tropo or better <laughs> some things on cloud nine i will leave it at that but um anyway <laughs> but i like george i think i think of all the beatles solo strangely i think george has the most consistent career i would of course Barring Dark Horse, where he, he should have, I always begged for years that he would re go back in the studio, re-record his vocals, and he never did. So. <laughs> but yeah, what about for good old Rich, Ringy? Ringo. Ringo, okay. So Ringo actually had this astonishing kind of comeback, you know, where he did The Weight of the World and Hot Takes Time, whatever. And then he got even better when he got Mark uh, um, Hudson. His face. Hudson with him, you know. Uh, so my favorite latter day album by him is Vertical Man or I, Ringo Rama. Ringo Rama is actually, and then Vertical Man's up there too. And I even like the Christmas album. And then when Ringo starts producing his own stuff, you know, it seems like he, he records like 10 tracks every couple of years and maybe two of them are worth a re-listen. And the rest are just like, here I am in Liverpool again. I'm singing another song. It's not very exciting. And then the next song is Peace and Love, Peace and Love, Peace and Peace and Peace and Love. I'm surprised he's never called an album Peace and Love, you know? But anyway, and I love Ringo. And it's like, I, I think personality-wise, he's my favorite Beatle. But, you know, it's like, Ringo, get somebody else to produce your record. <laughs> like, sound-wise, I think they're great. Yeah. Like, Bruce Sugar does a great job engineering, but like, I, I want to do this with Ringo. Uh, Ringo's career is all the albums he's done basically since Mark Hudson is take two tracks from each album, make out a good greatest hits, and it would probably be a decent album for Ringo. <laughs> that would be on the par with Ringo or Good Night Be or any of the others, because you know there's songs like Anthem I like. I like. Uh, you know, it's usually the first track off of every album. If you want to know which his best tracks are in every album, just the, the ones that came out in the last 20 years, just the first track on every Ringo album is his best track. So there we go. Anyway, so that's that's let's go back to 72. That's all I wanted to say about that. So, Seven, um, so sometime in New York City, uh, what are your feelings on this interesting record? <laughs> okay, so again, using this as an attempt, they hate them. They hate it. They hate it. They hate, 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 hate. Um, in the late 70s, when I became a Beatles fan, Apple Records was going bye-bye. So it was a challenge for me to get new copies as best I could on Apple Records of these solo albums because they were slowly being usurped by reissues on Capitol Records. It didn't have all the stickers and the booklets and the posters and all the other nifty garbage that they used to put in record albums. And so, and then the label would be the boring old red or purple or green or whatever label. And it's like, I want my apple on there. Or if it's not an apple, you know, Paul McCartney's face on the star on his cheek or whatever. You know, I want something or uh, Lennon turning into Yoko. I want something on that label that's referring to apple, not capital. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, I think in the late 70s, and again, I'm going to use this one, this one alerted me to the fact that albums went out of print. 
I didn't know albums went out of print. I figured it's the Beatles. All their stuff's got to stay in print. And so there's a few albums listed in the back and it has this little old key by it. Of course, since the days of CD and everything, they've reissued them. But back in the late 70s, you know, Two Virgins, uh, Life of the Lions, Electronic Sound, Wedding Album, uh, Live in New York City. No, not Live in New York. Live Peace in Toronto. Excuse me, I said that wrong. Yeah. All out of print. And Sometime in New York City and Let It Be and things like that were also out of print. Yeah. Things. And um, so I actually found Sometime in New York City there used to be a drugstore called Thrifty, which I think they all became Rite Aid. So, um, uh, and they used to have a little bin called the cutout bin, you know. And so, you know, you'd flip through it, and that's where I got Ro Ringo's Rotograph Year. I got Ringo the Fourth. I got Bad Boy. <laughs> I got Sometime in New York City. I got. Um, I, I know I got some Beatles like. Hear the Beatles tell all, introducing the Beatles. Uh, you know, that's that's where all that junk resided, you know. And, um, you know, it's like when I saw Sometime in New York City, and it was it was in the cutout bin and didn't actually have the cutout. I go, mine! And opened it up. It had the poster in it. It had the postcard in it. It had the petition in it. It had all the other junk in it that's supposed to be in it. And I go, oh my God, you know, and then I started playing it. And, you know, I was already pre-programmed by these books saying, this has got to be the worst album ever. But, you know, and this was the single and, you know, you can't say that word now, but I'm going to say it now, you know, woman is the nigger of the world. I had never heard before on the radio. They didn't play that until Lennon died on the radio, in my mind. Uh, I played it and I go, this is a pretty decent song. <laughs> and you know I, I you know I, I was like nine or ten years old 10 or 11 or something listening to this and I go I mean, you know it's like I don't know if I was a ultra feminist but I knew what he meant and you know I go yeah I, I agree with the sentiment you know it's pretty it's harsh a, yeah. but you know well, is it any more right. harsh that song than working class hero which is universally loved is a great song by Leonard, you know it is when it's a it's a message that I'm honestly surprised that song wasn't brought up in the uh, Me Too movement, which we are still in very much. Well, that's my thought about it too, and I was and I was thinking all day about doing this podcast with you. It's like if Lennon were still alive, or even if he wasn't, let's say it was an unreleased track. Or, or something, you know, that came out differently than the way things were, you know, you know, like, let's say everybody reveres Lennon, and they kind of do, you know, they kind of revere Lennon, oh, he's this peacemaker, and he wrote Imagine, and he wrote all these wonderful lofty songs and everything, and, you know, meanwhile, everybody else gets, you know, shit for being, you know, womanizer, for cheating, and doing, and it's like, you know, if you really look at your history of Lennon, Lennon was a pretty big asshole. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. beat women. He talks about it in his song, uh, in more than one song. He says it on Sgt. Pepper. He says it on Run for Your Life. You know, he's like, I'd rather see a dead little girl. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> so um, he wasn't an angel, but you know, because you know, he projected, especially by the end of his life, you know, oh, peace and harmony with Yoko and with the sun, and la la la, and all these wonderful tunes. Oh, he's like, it, you know, it's like. I, I'm sure, I, I always wonder if Lennon were still alive now, if the Me Too movement would like kind of say, well, what about this album, Lennon? You know, this one that says nigger on it. You know, that's that's racist. And you're, you're, you know, and you know, you're, you're, you're just a hypocrite. You're, you're sexist too. And you're, uh, you know, and it's like, and you know, I mean, one of the things I was going to talk about, the, I don't know if you know this, but you seem to be knowledgeable about most of these things, yeah. is the event that actually caused the Lost Weekend happened in 1970. Right. You, you know that, right? Yeah. Okay. You know, for years, nobody knew what that was, you know, so, and um, it's like, once you hear that, well, you know, yeah, he slept with another woman with Yoko within earshot or visual or whatever. You know, during the uh, 
Nixon's winning election night. McGovern was so supposed to win. Lennon was pissed off, and so he slept with the first chick he found. You know, certainly wasn't Yoko. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing she didn't kick him out, kick him to the curb that night. But I mean, I'm sure he slept on the sofa that night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think if he didn't sleep on the sofa, it might be a problem. <laughs> Anyway, so, um, yeah, I always wonder about Lenin, you know, like another one I think gets off the hook and it's only because these people are dead, you know, because they, they go after people like Bill Cosby, you know, here's a good example. If Bill Cosby died 20 years ago, like right after the Cosby show, and then all these allegations come to light in recent times, but he was long dead. Would they even care? Would they even say anything? Well, you know, and it's like, it's all hearsay. It's all rumor. You know, um, meanwhile, uh, one of uh, Cosby's idols was Bob Hope. And if you read this book, which I actually have behind my head, see that sideways word called Hope? Yeah. That book talks about Bob Hope's womanizing. It's gratuitous and, uh, Basically, Cosby did the Bob Hope rule book, which the rule book back in the old days for actors and musicians and comedians and any, or any sort of onstage or talent was basically uh, the wife would be the good, consistent wife. She'd keep her mouth shut and she'd say, I don't care what you do on the road. Just don't bring it home here and just bring home the money. And that's essentially what Camille Cosby did. That's essentially what Dolores Hope did. That's essentially what Yoko did until that one event. <laughs> and then she kicked him to the curb eventually because she's a stronger woman than that, you know, for that reason. But I think the only reason she didn't kick him to the curb that day is because it's John Lennon and you don't just kick John Lennon out of your house in one day. But it's like, uh, I think the repercussions of what happened in, then, it, I think it, you know, I know you said you like mind games, but I think it affected the quality of that album to a certain extent because I, I could see that. It's a straw over it. <laughs> you know, he knew he fucked up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> literally. Uh, and he goes, Wow, I can't do, I can't like um, make amends with him through song like I did with Paul. I'm going to have to do something different, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Mark, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, where can our listeners find you and contact you? Um, well, I have the Fun Ideas podcast, which is on iTunes. And it's also on um, <laughs> YouTube and video versions. And um, bring me on the spot. Usually I'm doing the asking of this. And then I have a website, uh, funideas.50webs. Dot com it's five zero webs. It has all my books. I have about fifteen books about uh, various subjects such as underdog, uh, Panther, Harvey Comics, the Monkeys, Beatles, um, other things. And um, so you can find my books on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com, or many of them, but not all of them, through Bear Manor Media. Awesome! Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me stop that recording.